welcome to GeoPath's uh, session called Pocket Aces. Since we are in Las Vegas, you should know if you hit the casino floor that Pocket Aces are the best opening hand of Texas Hold'em. And that's how we feel about what we're going to share with you today. The best possible opening methodology. <laughs> um, your host today, I'm Jill Nickerson. I, by day, I run Horizon Media's out-of-home department. And by night, I operate as the chairperson of GeoPath. And I'm honored to share the stage with my two esteemed colleagues from GeoPath. Uh, we have Scott Viachetti, who's SVP Operations, and Dylan Mabin, who is SVP of Product. <laughs> we have three sections that we want to review with you today. The first one is, is we want to take you through a high-level overview of the new uh, uh, Geopath Insights methodology. Dylan is going to take it a little bit deeper and show you some comparisons of the old impressions versus the new impressions. And then last but not least, in keeping with the theme of the conference, Scott's not gonna let you stay in Vegas. Um, <laughs> he's gonna walk us through the uh, training that we have set for you. So in my role as chair of GeoPath, one of the most common questions that I get is, how will we get, how and when will we get visibility into the methodology? So that's what we're gonna share with you today. Everyone knows that it's rather complex, so the, the feedback that I get is, how am I gonna be able to understand it, to be able to speak to it and about it with my clients? So that's the goal of this session today, or this section today. Um, how many buyers and sellers do we have? By show of hands, how many sellers? Okay, and how many buyers do we have? Okay, so it's more sellers than buyers. Um, next question, who was here when we launched the TAB methodology 10 years ago? Who was in the industry? Great, okay. So um, since a lot of you seem that like you're new, relatively new to the out-of-home department, it, or out of, to the out-of-home industry, um, it's important to set a baseline and make you very clear that Geopath Insights methodology builds off of TAB ratings. So it's important to take a step back before we get, before we move forward, since Geopath Insights builds off of the current system. So when we were operating over 10 years ago with DECs and showings, we were leaving money on the table. We needed to move forward and have a currency that allowed us to compete with other media channels. So the goal of TAB ratings and how we're operating today is in terms of weekly impressions, reach frequency, and TRPs. And again, it put us on a level playing field with other media channels. The legacy, legacy methodology has three categories. There's inputs, validation and standardization, and measurement outputs. If we look at the inputs, it starts with inventory attributes. So it starts with a latitude and longitude of a given unit. Um, from there, geopositioning elements are also very important, size, distance, and angle of the road. We first set standards as to what would be accepted. So latitude and longitude at the time, and this was the most advanced measurement at the, of its day, with every latitude and longitude that we received, it needed to be within, the actual physical unit needed to be within 30 feet of the actual unit location. Um, the size obviously varied determined based on the, um, the unit size. The distance of the unit from the road was fixed in some situations. So if a street type was set and a unit was set to the street type, then um, in some instances, units were just defaulted to 15 feet from the side of the road. And in terms of angle, we just really looked at perpendicular or parallel. So once those standards were set, the information came in and then it needed to be validated. Once the information was validated, it went into modeling. And we looked at circulation, mobility, visibility, and demographics. And there were six research partners that were part of that modeling. And the output, again, was weekly impressions, reach frequency, and TRPs. 
So the geopath methodology is more precise and more predictive because we're using mobile data, and so that allows us to have more precise measures. And it allows us to elevate and operate how we're advancing our methodology. So the, the building blocks for geopath predictive methodology still includes inputs, validation and standardization, and measurement outputs. So the inventory attributes are still latitude and longitude. The geo positioning includes angle orientation, distance, size of the unit, and roadside position. But because we're using mobile data, the measures are more precise. The latitude and longitude standard is now going to be at the millionth decimal point, which is seven digits to the right of the decimal. Um, the angle is um, to the nearest azimuth, which is um, the, the nearest degree of the, the nearest degree of the angle is called an azimuth, so the angle is, um, that, so it's more, more precise, and the distance of each unit is measured to the nearest foot or the mere, nearest inch. Then it goes into modeling, and the modeling includes mobility data, circulation, ve vehicular occupancy, pedestrian counts, place of residence, speed, and target segmentation, and there are a multitude of different data providers that are helping us with that modeling. The measurement outputs give us more precise weekly impressions, reach frequency, and TRPs, but it also allows us to find our audiences, um, identify their audiences through indices. Can you not hear me? Okay, sorry. Um, and we're also able to deliver composition and coverage. So the key differences between the legacy methodology and our methodology is mobile data, more precise measures, and understanding the variability of the measures by month. And over time, we're going to be able to continue to be more precise. So now Dylan's going to take you through breaking the magician's code. How's everyone doing? Did anyone go see any magicians this week? All right, uh, so there is always questions about, around what Geopath is doing, how the methodology is uh, executed, and we really want to make sure that we try to be as clear as possible with uh, how this evolution to this new methodology has occurred. What to expect when you start digging into some of the new metrics. Um, obviously, we're changing things. When you change everything, not everything's going to be the same. Uh, but we want to make sure that you're well equipped to understand when something has changed, why that is. And we have a lot of information behind the metrics to help walk you through that. Uh, and one of the other things that I think you'll find very satisfying when you start looking at some of the precision that's behind the new metrics is it's very relatable. We still have uh, audience delivery metrics now that get down to the activity by hour of day footprints by zip code, and it really sort of speaks to the true nature of every single unit having its own uh, sort, of pro sort of profile. Uh, I think Nancy last year talked about how every unit has its own personality, and that really is the case. When you talk about publishers, a website is a publisher. Every single channel on a TV uh, set is its own unique audience. Every single unit that's out there has its own unique audience how people engage with it, how fast they're traveling, where they're coming from, where they're going, who they are. And that's what we want to get down to. So we'll talk about how we're doing that. Now, at the core of everything, this is very different from our last transition when we went from circulation to impressions. We're going from impressions to impressions, right? So everyone take a deep breath. It's going to be OK. We're just using better ingredients. And this, these are ingredients that people are more familiar with now. When you, you know, Jill's first, uh, first point was that it, this is now mobile data driven. And people are very familiar with mobile data. I mean, there's a lot of stuff behind what is mobile data, but people are, can relate to it. You know, it's coming from information around your mobile device, in your, in your, in your, in your pocket, on your wrist, uh, connected cars, all sorts of information can how, now be used to understand uh, exactly how people are moving around the, the marketplace. So. Starting at the foundation, what we used to use was DOT traffic counts, right? We looked at a segment of road. We looked at what the most relevant DOT traffic count existed for that segment of road, and we used it. In two-directional roadways, if it was perpendicular, we divided by half because only half the traffic can see it. Fairly straightforward, but we were looking at DOT traffic counts without the context of everything else around it. Could have been a couple years old. Each DOT traffic count could have been collected 
uh, by a, a strip on the road. It could have been counted by someone that was on a clicker that really hated their job on a Tuesday afternoon and they didn't really care. So there was always some risk around looking at one single data set without looking at context around everything else. And I think that's another thing that you should take away today is that when we look at information, when we're working with our partners like City Labs, who's here in the room, we look at all sorts of different data to help contextualize another set of data. We look at traffic counts against movements. We look at movements against speeds on networks. How many people can actually tra travel down that roadway if they're, if they're going this fast? And so there's a lot of information that we're checking against one another. So now when we look at traffic counts, we look at the mobile data, we look at that movement, we look at the trip paths that people take to go from point A to point B, what roads are they taking, what exit ramps are they taking to get to those destinations, and we can look at those traffic counts on those individual roadways. And so instead of looking at one traffic count on this segment of roadway and looking at this one traffic count on this segment of roadway, we're now taking in over a one and a half million traffic counts and all of that trip movement is painting a much clearer, much smoother picture of how many people are on roadways. So overall, traffic's still pretty similar to what we would expect before. It's not like there's hundreds of millions of more people that are traveling on the roadway now just because we're using a new methodology. They're still there, so that's a good thing. One of the other big differences is vehicular occupancy. In the past, we used some information from the American, uh, was it the National Household Transportation Survey, um, it's a very robust survey. And we use this information to understand, on average, how many persons per vehicle are there traveling. Uh, and we use an, a national average. So no matter what roadway you're on, no matter what time of day, no matter what purpose, we use that information. Again, it's not that the previous methods were bad. It was the best that existed at the time. But we now have better information. Because of mobile data, we know when people are traveling, why they're traveling, where they're going. Is it a, a journey to work? Is it a trip to school? Is it to, sh to go shopping? Each one of those trips has different purposes, uh, different number of persons in those vehicles. And when we count the number of vehicles and we know how many people are in those vehicles, we have a much more accurate understanding by hour a day of how many people have the opportunity to see a unit. Now across the board, instead of that sort of flat line of 1.67 persons, five plus, across all markets, now, now, looking at different markets, they, the personality of those marketplaces themselves, you're going to start seeing some of these averages change it. So areas that have high vehicular, owner, high, uh, vehicular ownership, you know, go out to rural areas, you're going to have multiple vehicles per household. You go into the city, I'm not sure how many people are here from New York, but very few people have vehicles. So the, the travel behavior is going to be very different from market to market. Pedestrian traffic, this is another big change. Uh, because of mobile data, you've probably seen pictures of heat maps of uh, activity uh, in cities or around events. Um, there's a lot of really cool things that we can do with mobile location data. And one of those things that we're able to do now is have a much clearer act, uh, uh, understanding of the pedestrian activity on every single roadway. Our existing methods were good for the time, but we now have data that can drill down to individual road segments in a way that we never could before. Uh, illumination, this is another fun one. Um, we used, used to basically categorize inventory into three buckets. You either didn't have lights on it and you had 12 hour illumination, or you had uh, illumination for the evening hours and then they turned off around midnight, or it was lit 24 hours a day. If it's 24 hours a day, you got all the circulation. If it was uh, 18 hours, you got 95% of the circulation. If it was 12 hours, you got 67% of the circulation, which is essentially saying that during the daylight hours on a stretch of road, 67% of the people were traveling by that unit. Not every roadway is gonna look like that. And with the new methods, we can now understand the activity that's local to that roadway by hour of day, day of week, and we can actually look at also where that unit's located within the time zone. We know when the sun's rising, we know when the sun's setting. We actually can look at much more information about how the activity on that roadway correlates to when it's actually illuminated, so when it can be seen. So there's more precision in there as well. Now that's changed quite a bit because when we are looking at where inventory is located, the activity, you put inventory in areas where there is more activity during those daylight hours, we're actually seeing a little bit of a lift across the, uh, the board uh, for uh, circulation during illuminated periods. 
uh, visibility adjustment. So visibility is a big uh, buzzword if you're in the digital space right now. People are always talking about, well, could it be seen? Uh, the assumption is if it's displayed on a phone that it's a, an ad delivered, you're looking at it. A lot of people ignore ads. How many people look at every single ad that's on their phone? Yeah. So we know that that also was the case in roadside. We, we had to come to terms when we went to eyes on. We went from circulation to impression, so we can't assume that every single person that's driving down every single roadway by every single unit is going to see it. Now that circulation is very important because that's the potential audience, but we needed to talk about who's actually consuming the media. So we needed to talk about eyes on. So how likely is that unit to be noted if they're driving by it? So we took a lot of the physical attributes, the orientation, the side of the road, did a lot of field work, collected a lot of information to come up with a predictive model to understand how likely is an object to be seen based upon its orientation. But in the existing system, we only really categorize things by left hand, right hand read. Now, because of the precision of the mapping systems that we have, we know how far left, how large is that object in my field of view, how much dwell time do I have, because we have speed on every single roadway. So the model is much more sensitive and also covers much more types of inventory. And so when we're looking at how the visibility score is changing from the existing methods to the new methods, it doesn't really fall into this binary, is it right-hand read, left-hand read. There's lots of different inventory, lots of different orientations to the roadway, dwell time, speed. So a lot of these things are going to be changing. It's much more sensitive to, than, than it was in the past. And also much more defensible. One of the questions that I always hated getting when I first started working back in the TAB days was, why is this impression this, and why is this impression this? These two units are on the same street, but they're across the, the intersection. And it was really challenging because one DOT traffic count might be from this. Uh, this year, this DOT traffic count is from this year. And we really just had to use what we had now, all that sort of connected and making a lot more sense and making our lives, I think, a lot easier as we're explaining things. This is the uh, distribution for uh, bulletins, the new visibility scores versus the old ones. Um, so yes, yeah, so I kind of went over this um, speed data, very important, not just for uh, visibility of a unit in general, but also for digital. The faster you're traveling, the uh, shorter dwell time, the shorter the dwell time, the less likely you are going to see something. If you're sitting in slow traffic and it takes you in two minutes to drive by a bulletin, much more likely to see it than if you're driving by at 60 miles an hour. Make sense? Hopefully. So speed data. Now we did have a lot of speed data before. We did have, uh, but it wasn't available on every single roadway. And where we didn't have it available, we had sort of, sort of defaults like posted speed limit or uh, average for that road class. Now that we have speed data on every single roadway, and again, the reason why we have it now is because of the proliferation of uh, mobile data, connected cars, there's just a lot more information that we have at our fingertips. Now we can look at the, uh, how that, that speed has changed by market. We see a couple areas, some notable ones, uh, San Francisco, New York, Washington, D.C., Seattle, San Diego. Uh, we already knew that they had very slow uh, vehicular traffic. It's actually even slower than we thought before because of this new data. Utica kind of jumped out on the map. We have 40 units in Utica, and they're all uh, street furniture. Now, based upon the road class that it was before, the uh, best information that we had was that it was 45 miles an hour. In reality, it's somewhere closer to 20. So that information, again, it's more accurate, it's coming from more reliable sources, and it's all rolling up for us when we're calculating impressions. Out of market impressions. This one is going to be really important. So uh, existing systems, we use a lot of journey to work surveys. Journey to work uh, comprises about 15% of all trips. You know, if you're working, it's something that you focus on a lot, but not all of your trips. You're going to make three trips, four trips a day. One of them's going to work, one of them's coming home, but you might be dropping the kids off at school, might be going shopping. There's a lot of different trip purposes, different vehicular occupancy for those trips as well, uh, and where those trips are coming from. Now with mobile data, again, not just looking at local traffic, we're looking at long distance travel. We now can capture people that aren't commuting, because you're only going to commute, you know, hopefully not more than two hours a day directionally, but now we can look at all sorts of trips, vacation trips, people that are coming into market from all over, and those trips may be very, very long. 
So when we look at where people are coming from, we have a lot of inventory on bulletins. Uh, bulletins, I'll show an example here in uh, I-10 in Louisiana. The people in Lake Charles, very small DMA just to the uh, west of Baton Rouge, not a large population, and most of the people that are traveling through there are not going to be residents of Lake Charles. So most of those people are out of market audiences. There's still 100,000 people traveling on that roadway every week, but now we know where they live, right? So we know a lot more about it. There's still impressions, but now that unit might be more useful for regional uh, audience delivery rather than in-market audience. So there's some information that we have at our fingertips now that may challenge what we may have been using inventory for, but we also can explain it now. We can visualize where those people are coming from and, and tell different stories. So here's some examples of our existing methods on the left. Uh, the very light shades of yellow was 90 to 100% in-market audiences. Now when we are looking at the mobile home location, again, the home footprint of where people are coming from, in-market versus out-of-market, this is the Atlanta DMA, you're seeing a lot more out-of-market audience on interstate roadways, as you would expect. We were seeing 100% audience on some interstates in our existing methods. That was kind of hard to explain when you're really, when you start working with a client who's really number savvy, and people are number savvy now. They know digital, they're gonna ask these questions, they're gonna tell you to show your work, and we need to be able to do that with you. Here's the uh, Southern Louisiana example. You see the I-10 corridor going uh, east to west, west to east. Now you're seeing those dark dots. Those are units there where there's somewhere around 70 to 80% of audience out of market. Now again, those may not actually have any impression changes. Still same number of people, but now we know where they're coming from. Uh, New York City, another sort of enlightening one. You see the, on the left, most audience we assumed was from in the, the New York City market. New York, Midtown, Financial District, there's a lot of people that visit New York. Um, how many people have visited New York or live in New York? Right. So people visit there, tourist destinations, so now we have information that can capture that. So we can have those conversations and use data to back up those conversations when people ask us to show our work. Reach and frequency, this is another really interesting one. Um, we had two, two systems uh, previously of how we calculated reach and frequency. Uh, we had the uh, ADS, the reach frequency module, so this is sort of unit by unit reach frequency or specific sets of, it, uh, of units. Uh, reach frequency combined in market, DMAs, CBSAs, counties, right? Those were sort of our building blocks. Now, because of the precision of that home location, we can start talking about reach in geographies that may not be a standard market. We can start talking about audience delivery within a zip code. So that level of precision is also going to be changing the a way that we talk about audience if people want to. Again, you don't need to change the way that you're necessarily selling, but if you want to have conversations, if a client comes to you and says, I'm looking to do this, you don't necessarily have to say, I can't do that. Right? There's a lot more tools at your fingertips. So overall, across all inventory, the impression levels are about the same. Some markets are going to be up, some markets are going to be down, and we're going to work with all of our members to help with this transition because there are a lot of things that are changing, and we want to make sure that you have this opportunity when we start reviewing this information with you to use it as a learning experience. Make sure that you educate yourself, your teams on what's changing and why? What is this evolution? What's, what's, what, what do I have now at my fingertips to start having uh, more strategic conversations with my clients? So. Cool, Scott. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>So I know that that was a lot of kind of detail that, that Dylan went through today. And um, I know that the repetition is key in hearing this and talking about this and asking questions to us is really what's going to help. And really, we want to make sure that everybody is feeling comfortable throughout this transition, throughout the whole period of us moving from kind of, as Jill said, eyes on to the new insight suite. And it's been, um, you know, definitely... Uh, you know, a transition process, because again, as we said, change isn't always easy. 
And um, we want to assure everybody that there are, uh, that there's information that you can access. First of all, before I even talk about these slides, uh, the slide up here, just reach out. We, we're happy, Dylan and I have these conversations all the time with our members. We're, he we're here to answer any questions. We can go in more detail on all of this. But just know we are, we are building a training and onboarding process for all this. It's going to be a, a, a full curriculum that any of new members, old members can, can actually go through and learn and understand the, the foundations of media measurement. Um, actually, if any of you, I know, I noticed some of you were here yesterday for, for the chaining session that Enza Quixote over there and myself put on yesterday. And that is actually the foundations of our curriculum that we're putting together. So really helping our members know those basics of, you know, all the way back to what's an impression, what is reach and frequency, uh, and using that to build on to, okay, well, now that this insight suite is rolling out, how do I use that? And then how do I tie those two things together? Now that I know all the basics of metrics, then now I know how to use the insight suite, how do I use that to create value for my clients, right? And that's what we're here, and that's what the curriculum is gonna be all about. And um, if you saw Kim's session this morning, she mentioned our, our great futures council. And they're gonna be key in helping us create this curriculum, especially in this application, and especially in just creating value out of what we're what we're putting out to the industry. So again, I just want to assure you that there will be training. There's going to be a, a, a great um, curriculum put together. It's going to be very uh, video driven, however you want to consume it. There's, there's actually a lot of materials already built and that's what I want to talk about next. It doesn't mean that you have to wait until it comes out. There's information there available to all of you, to all of our members today. If you go to our Geek Out library on our website, it's just the, if you go to the uh, geopath.org, go to the Geek Out tab, and go log into the Geek Out library. There's a host of different information there. There are training decks, there's training videos there, there are one-pagers, um, there's also uh, a lot of just available research and infographics for you and for your clients to use. So um, I encourage you to, to go there and to, to get whatever information you need to, um, to educate yourselves and to educate your people in your organization. Um, and other ways that we're supporting the, the training as well is we're doing monthly training sessions. So the last Thursday and Friday every month, I do a monthly roundup of what's evolved, what has changed at Geopath in terms of the Insight Suite, how do you use that, and how do you use that to create value, again, for your clients? Because that's key, and I know I've said that a couple times, but it is really about us helping you to create value for your clients. How are you able to take the insights today available in the Insight Suite to actually use them to, to um, again, solve problems? And uh, we realize that we need to break those, again, out into two separate types of training. So. Uh, the Thursday, moving forward, uh, if you've been joining these right along, you know we've been doing the same session on Thursdays and Fridays. But starting um, next week, we're going to do a foundational training. So that'll be a walkthrough of the Insight Suite to give you the lay of the land, because I know not everybody's been able to log in and, and really kind of explore it yet. So that's what the Thursday session is going to be about. And then on Friday, we'll do a, a use case walkthrough, a member-driven use case walkthrough. So I've been working with a lot of our members uh, across you know, big, big media owners, small media owners, agencies. We're gonna create use cases that are relevant for the breadth of our, of our membership base and really walk through all of those as well. So um, that's gonna happen next week as well. And um, just before we, I think we do have time for questions. We weren't sure if we were going to, so I think we'll take some questions, but uh, if you guys will bear with me for a second, I'd like to just give you the sneak peek of the uh, of the Insight Suite, if you didn't get a chance to see this tomorrow, this morning in Kim's session, here's a little overview of the uh, the Insight Suite. I don't know why it's not playing all of a sudden.
Okay. Yeah. Um, so Dylan just wanted me to, to mention about the, the API is actually working and available for, for all of our members as well if you put, want to pull data into your systems that way. So, um, so we do have some time for, for questions, so I think we'll, we'll, we'll take some. Um, but I do want to say, if you are here and can come tomorrow at 1230, we're going to actually go through a little bit more in depth than what we did today, and we'll actually war work through some use cases together as a group so you can really see how to use the Insight Suite, how to kind of pull data out of it, and how to, like as I've said already, you know, create value for your clients. So I encourage everybody to come tomorrow at 1230 for our training session as well in this same room, the same place. So any questions that anybody has? You can just raise your hand and shout them out or there are microphones around the room as well. Any other questions? Sure. Hey, there we go. Hi. Can you tell us more about the data from the cell companies, from the, the telephones, and, and uh, where that may be going in the future as it relates to DFS? In, uh, in terms of like uh, the. Is there the more data going to be coming? What's the extent of the data? Sure. Uh, the, I mean, better data. Uh, mm -hmm. For sure. Um, so when we first uh, piloted this process almost three years ago, when we uh, did just a handful of uh, markets to, to basically show that this could be done with the data, uh, we did this in Chicago and a couple other markets. Primarily at that time, we were working with AirSage, which then feeds data into City Lab to create the Cerebralytics uh, sort of foundational trip movement. When we add demographic information, we use our visibility adjustment, our inventory database to calculate audience. At that time, uh, AirSage's portfolio was primarily carrier data. Uh, and since then, the location data, in, in two years, the location data landscape has changed dramatically. And now most of that is actually coming from background SDK data. Uh, so this would be like device level that? data. What is that? Uh, uh, SDK is a, a software development kit. Uh, you'll hear that acronym a lot with the location conversation about location data. Essentially, anybody that's turning on their phone that is allowing applications to use location data, the software uh, is using probably some sort of code that they've licensed from someone else to help interpret the information from the location services on site, the GPS chip, the Wi-Fi chip, the Bluetooth devices, the altimeter, all sorts of things are on their phones that these days that help get really precise information. And so that device level information is now being used by AirSage um, and that has sort of reached this level of maturity where it's actually supplanted some of the carrier data had all sorts of, uh, and it was, it was good for what we were using it for, but there were certain sort of limitations, and I think a, a quite a bit of fear around some of the regulatory future of that type of data. Is, is GeoPath acquiring uh, all the data that's available from all the phone? <laughs> solve with the location data, all of that data isn't useful for answering all of the questions. 
Uh, and some of it might not, we might, may not see it by frequently enough to make any sort of inference of how representative that is. Uh, but with the good data, you may end up drawing out more than half of all of the devices that you see because there's just not enough to obtain from them. But those that you do see of high quality can infer quite a bit of home location, uh, uh, the activity points that they're, 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 they're going to, how representative those individuals are of those home locations. And so that information can be used to do quite a bit of fantastic stuff with the place space, with the neighborhood place space measurement, uh, helping out with region frequency, all sorts of things like that. So is there more data in the future that, that will be relevant to this and really need to enhance? Yeah, I mean, I think it really comes from um, sort of the, the, the mobile device, smart phone, smart anything, connected car, the, the, the sort of service providers out there that car company, um, they're realizing that there's a lot of information that they have made been collecting for a separate purpose, and they can find other organizations, other companies that have see value in that. Um, I think the biggest challenge that we've had in, in solving the, the sort of the new audience measurement is really getting at where the data is coming from and why it was collected in the first place. Uh, you may recall maybe five, six years ago, even three years ago, even maybe even still today, there are some companies out there that are using mobile big stream data. Now, big stream data, ton of volume, very relevant if you're trying to tie in uh, mobile uh, mobile uh, buying on, on your mobile phone. However, sort of the nature of that data is very infrequent. It's only going to show up when you are retrieving an app, right? And so if you aren't using an app that has any sort of ad content, Whereas sort of the background location data that's always on, essentially what makes a smart device smart is that <coughs> context. So the triggering when you're near the bank to you know, remind you to go get money from an ATM or something like that. Or you know, you've seen the, um, if you use an iPhone, they have like the, the wallet pop up with your Starbucks card so you can see your Starbucks every morning. All that information sort of feeding back into this uh, location data <coughs> Any other questions? There's just a couple minutes left. We can field probably one or two more. Any other thoughts? One last question for anybody? I'm curious.
smaller sample. It, it could depend. Um, I mean, in New York City, fortunately, the, the cell towers have been deployed, so location data shows up. Um, and you end up having sort of the, the, the dimensional, you know that the people might be in this area, and then they show up five minutes later down uh, in Midtown. So you end up also being able to sort of interpret what network someone might be using to get from point A to point B. So looking at location data also just in that moment that you're seeing it, it doesn't paint a clear picture of mm -hmm. what is going on. You want to look through time. Where was it? Where is it going? What else is it? What have we seen it mm -hmm. doing in the past? Does it live in a neighborhood that's more likely to use public transit? Things like that. Right. But yeah, I it, is, it is challenging to get in, in that third dimension of, of multiple levels. Fortunately, I mean, this is another thing why we were able to do place space now is because we love the mapping infrastructure of, of place space environment is very detailed. Uh, here now has sort of um, very detailed uh, sort of layouts, access points, number of doors, all that information we now use for place space methods to link access points up to convenience buildings, uh, things like that. So it's there are there are data sets now that didn't exist five years mm -hmm. ago. Well, just want to say thank you to everybody for um, joining us today and uh, paying, you know, listening and, and asking questions. Um, it, I'm sure there's still more questions, or there always will be. Uh, we'll be here to answer some questions post post breakout session. But also, if you see any of the Futures Council members around the the conference, ask them. You know, they're they're part of the team as well. And um, again, just one more plug for the session tomorrow. I think it's going to be really helpful. We're going to talk about a lot of the stuff that Dylan, Dylan talked about today. We'll dig deeper into the methodology. We'll also, as I said, walk through the Insight Suite, so I'll give you a, um, kind of a live walkthrough, and we'll work through a use, two use cases together. So I think it'll be really interesting and gives you an opportunity to ask more questions. The longer sessions, two hours, so we can go deeper on, on things more so than we could today. So again, just want to say thank you. And also, always reach out to us at geekout at geopath.org. If you ever have questions on anything, uh, if you need a password reset, you need a data point, you have a question about a, an individual unit, please reach out to us here. Uh, you want to you know, set up a training session. This is a, the best and quickest way to reach out to us. So geekout at geopath.org. And uh, we're here and available for you. And just want to make sure that everybody uh, knows that. So great, and have a great rest of the conference, everybody.